Hello, everybody, and welcome to, you'll probably agree, we're finally <laughs> talking about the Oscars 2018. <laughs> The first film on our list is uh, The Shape of Water. Oh, very good. It's a lot of blood. What went on in here? Ooh. It was you that found my fingers. There was mustard on them. Pat, what did you think of Shape of Water? The Shape of Water was my number one film in my top ten list. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it, it, it took all of its themes to the highest level. Whether you want to call it a Cold War thriller, whether you wanted to call it a love story, whether you wanted to call it a, a metaphor for the time of 1962 uh, in, in, in the way it treated uh, African Americans, gay people, et cetera, et cetera. I just was enthralled by this film. And it was a movie about movies. You know, the main character lives above a cinema. They are uh, immersed in you know, watching old movies on TV. It was just, it really um, affected me on a very uh, visceral level. To me, it felt like, just from a story perspective, he was kind of going over a, a bunch of uh, themes that he's already tackled before. It's, it's a great first Del Toro film. Like, if you've never heard of this guy, which I think yeah. is wonderful that it's getting all this Oscar exposure, um, but if you're you know, going back deep into the catalog, it might seem kind of retreadish. Uh, as far as the social themes, I agree that he kind of touches on a lot. I don't think he tackles much. And what he does tackle, I think he kind of handles ham-handedly. We didn't see nothing. What am I doing interviewing the shit cleaners? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear your rebuttal to this, but. Uh... Well, I, I mean, you know, I don't, I, I, when I say themes, I wasn't trying to say that's the, 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 the gist of the movie. Sure. I think that people who live today would be very interested to know that, you know, a closeted gay man and African Americans and, and, and just workers in general were treated with such disdain in a time you know, that wasn't too far, you know, 50 years ago, a half century. Why did she fall in love with him? That's, that's, I like, think, that's I a think central it, question. I, well, I again, that. spoiler I, alert, I think she was part of the fish people because her gills become active when, they, when she becomes a, un, goes underwater. See, she was found in a basket by the sea, very Moses-like. Oh. She is, she is the, she's the connection between his world and our world. And is, is part, it could be a amalgamation. You know, the scratches on her throat and, and the fact that she can't speak. When he looks at me, he doesn't know how I am incomplete. He sees me as I am. It's just a bit of a stretch for me watching this this fantasy film that has so much going on. We've got I, nine films. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Let's move on. One movie, I, I think, I didn't know if it was going to get nominated or not, but everybody was rooting for it to get nominated. I don't know if it was deserving of it, was Get Out. Yeah. Yeah. What? Do they know I'm black? Should they? You might want to, you know. Mom and Dad, my black boyfriend will be coming up this weekend. I just don't want you to be shocked that he's a black man. <laughs> it's an all right film. It's a pretty mm. lousy horror movie. And as mm. far as a social allegory, I love the fact that so many people went to see it because that means that there's perhaps studios more willing to take chances on mainstream uh, stories of this nature. I just don't think this is the film. Yeah. I think this is this is the template, and years from now, perhaps even Jordan Peele is going to improve on it and make something really remarkable. Again, it was something that really affected me when I saw it initially. Being being an older person, I, I have seen a lot of changes mm -hmm. in attitudes in race and feminism and all that stuff. Yeah. And to see somebody of Jordan Peele's age commenting upon that in the way he did and the allegory that he made was stunning to me. Now, I wrote this movie in, um, in the Obama era and uh, we were in this, we this post-racial lie. 
This movie was meant to call out the fact that racism is, is still simmering underneath the surface. And it, it can really affect the people who need, who, who would go, okay, I'm going to the movies. Hey, I love Key and Peel. Let's go see <laughs> yeah. Get Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they're not, sitting there and they're going, well, I'm thinking about some of my attitudes. Yeah. You know, as you, and, and, and again, and the 50th anniversary of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner to do the exact same plot with that sinister it, twist to with it. the yeah. sinister twist it, it it was just sheer genius to me so. right i remember i was at a film event and i was talking to this guy who runs an arts program so like the inner city and stuff like that and he was telling me uh that it, it felt like a movie like where moonlight felt like a movie that was written by a black guy to write a movie for white people so he could win an oscar about a mm. film about homosexuality and uh, race relations. We could talk about that yeah. too, but go uh, ahead. <laughs> he said that Get Out was pretty much like spot on with uh, race relations. Fair skin has been in favor for the past what, couple of hundreds of years, but now the pendulum is swung back. Black is in fashion. I wish it stayed as a psychological thriller yeah. instead mm. of ending in the third act like a slasher. <laughs> Because yeah, I, I guess I wasn't even considering that because I, I was I was again going with the flow of the film, and I, I see when you say you know uh, we can study this and say oh well there was an alternate ending that was changed by the studio, mm -hmm. but to me that again broke the broke the 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 back of what the movie you know just to have some humor. You know, to after we had experienced this for like 90 minutes, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what you want out of a film. I feel like I've seen I've seen Get Out a hundred times as a horror movie. Right. Um, I feel like if you're gonna go for something with and and try and make a political statement, then you inherently have to make people uncomfortable. People should not have been leaving Get Out praising it for being so progressive and edgy. I think they should have been lamenting the fact that they'd just been horrified and taken away from it that it was progressive and edgy. Shit! Ah, she's so, she's a fucking, she's a, ah, she's a genius. It's too uh, feel good uh, right, right. For, for, for my taste. Oh my, it's a terrible thing to waste. Let's go to uh, Lady Bird. Ah, yeah. <laughs> you should just go to City College. You know, with your work ethic, just go to City College and then to jail and then back to City College and then maybe you'd learn to pull yourself up and not expect everybody to do everything. <laughs> Here we go again. I, no, no, no. That's, uh, that was that's one of my my two big ones. I'm I'm a I'm a fan of Lady Bird. I I oh. really felt like uh, Lady Bird was a movie that really grew on me. Oh, you good. know. Uh, and when I first saw it, and it grew on I me mean, literally as the movie was playing, which sure. was the beauty of it. That is the beauty of yeah. it. Yeah, because like when it starts out, I'm just going, what's the big deal? This is just another coming-of-age film. It's playing all the scenes that we know, you know, girl finds guy. You know, you have the mother who's kind of oppressive, which it was interesting how they reversed the roles where instead of the father being sort of the one who's overbearing, it was the mother, yeah. but still she's loving. And then, well, I'll get into the ending later. That really relates to that. And then how the father was really kind of the one who was so loving. It was almost like he was a pushover. <laughs> but as a but movie, they was, did show him as that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But in the most loving way possible. Yeah. You know, which is great. But as, as the movie progressed, we 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 first see the scenes, you know, kind of playing at a normal pace, right? But then. As we know, as we get older and life progresses and it gets faster, the pacing of all these scenes that we know keep going faster and faster and faster and faster because that's how life is. It goes before us like just in an instant. So then the most wonderful part of that film is I'm like, oh, wow. Now all of a sudden this isn't just like another Richard Linkletter film or another sort of <laughs> mumblecore film. People would ask, well, so, so what happens in the movie? And I was like... Not much. <laughs> this is something. This is something different. This is something that really echoes what this is. What Boyhood should have been, you yeah, know. Oh gosh. Which Boyhood was so vastly overrated. But <laughs> <laughs> here's what I'll say about it. And again, you know, again, being a little, little of of, of experience and age, I'm relating to the mother and father character very, very distinctly. But I'm also relating 
to a Cersei Ronan's character yeah. as Lady Bird because everybody. Sersha. It's actually Sersha. Uh, sushi? You're right. It's rapid. It's just woo. It starts to like go in, in, in like a, a lightning pace by the time you get past the Christmas season in yeah. your senior year. So um, I was really impressed how she captured that. That number one, number two, a middle class family. How often do you see that yeah. in the movies? Uh, paycheck to paycheck family who is struggling and tr seeing how are we going to get this person to college? Yeah, you know, and and wow, you know that those two things were so remarkable in that film and so followed through on. So many people have come up to me and said, I've been that daughter or I've been that mother. And I couldn't be more proud of the work that we did and I couldn't be more grateful that it's been embraced this way. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the movie that I wish Juno had been. Ah. Um, it, it reminded me of a, of a really good version of Juno and Saved uh, from what, 20, 2003 or 2004. The one thing that I absolutely loved about this film was the ending because ah. it didn't... Apparently, someone's like constructing something downstairs, but uh, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, uh, but the the ending was so great because it doesn't end where most coming of age films end. Like usually, like you know, go go back to like American Graffiti or something like that. It ends where they're going to college. Here, our pro I'm gonna give it away. I don't well, give that, a shit. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, you expect it to fade to black when she yeah. gets to her 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 dynamic school that she always wanted. Yeah, but then. Yeah, she gets to college, and it's not great. It's not like, oh, I'm moving on with my <laughs> right, life. Right. Instead, college is miserable. She's no longer in her comfort zone, and then right. she understands who her mother is and why she loved her. And then there's just this whole element to it <laughs> that really... You didn't like that? That was, that was what really no, won No, I'm saying I got, I got yeah. chills. No, 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 like, no. You, you, you that described was like, it perfectly. Eh. Yeah, yeah. That I'm, was, I'm not sure that about the reconciliation with mother. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Well, I, hey, again, just like everybody goes yeah. through senior year, if you went to college, you go through freshman year. Yeah. And you go to a party and you get drunk and you make out with somebody you don't see after that, yeah. you know? And, and I'm like, wow, you know, she actually, instead of, you know, just fading to black, she actually showed a little bit of life yeah. that happens after you get to college. And it's not all roses. It's not and all peach roses. Fuzz. Yeah. You sometimes end up in the emergency room. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I had always wanted to make a movie that was basically about home. What does home mean? And the way that it's difficult to see it clearly when you're there and it's not until you're gone that you look back and you understand what it was. <laughs> yeah, she did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lady Bird, one of the, if I had a criticism of it, it's that it's not like a Netflix series. I would I would love to watch yeah. these characters and, and follow them. Yeah. You know, I'd watch That's Saoirse Ronan go to college and <laughs> get out of college and do whatever. Oh, okay, yeah. What I'd really like is to be on Math Olympiad. But math isn't something you're terribly strong in. That we know of yet. Moving on from a movie that's filled with empathy and understanding, we go to three billboards outside of Ebbing, God, Missouri. Finally. <laughs> yes, uh, finally. Finally, I get to crap on something. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mildred Hayes, why did you put up these billboards? My daughter, Angela, was murdered seven months ago. It seems to me the police department is too busy torturing black folks to solve actual crime. Mike, I am going to go and watch this again. I, yeah. have, I have been completely bamboozled by the praise of this. I mean, it took the ensemble at the SAG Awards. I agree. It took the best picture at Golden Globe for drama. This is an allegory picture. And I, I think anybody, everybody who knows movies or goes in or read novels can understand that this small town is representing either America or something broader, you know what I'm saying? And it's just, um, it just didn't work because of the small town setting yeah. for me. Yeah. I didn't like the symbolism of using it, it, it smacked of a screenwriter writing, putting a setting down and writing about nothing that he knows. I think my natural tone is always to start from a peculiar place or a, a slightly odd perspective. <laughs> On a visceral level, like it's satisfying to see. 
a movie that was just so cruel and yeah. judgmental. Yes. And it was yes. a movie that just, was like... I, hitting on all the keywords for yeah. me, too. And the, the, that was the thing. Like, where Lady Bird was a movie that you understood people and they're three-dimensional. You know, this is a film that was definitely... Like written and directed by the guy who did Seven Psychopaths, by the guy who did In Bruges, by yeah. the guy who did Six Shooter, yeah. you know, by the guy who relishes and loves violence. I'm sorry about Angie, but the town is dead set against these billboards. You know who threw that can? What can? How about you, sweetheart? Uh, no, I, I didn't really. <sighs> Go, girl. Think of a movie that looks at a small town that she was also in, like Fargo. Sure, there's like some character elements up there, but there's still an element of complexity and love to those characters where they're not just as dumb as they seem, except for maybe William H. Macy's mm. character. <laughs> yeah, right now, you're darn tootin'. Where in this one, it just relishes with someone who's not from the United States. You know, well, just saying this comparison. is what's wrong with you guys, you know? Because yeah. it's a good comparison because there's a guy, the, the Coen brothers took life in a, in a kind of middle class, yeah. uh, working class city and created these desperations yeah. associated with it. There's more to life than a little money, you know. Don't you know that? But in this film, the desperations are a so line. broad <laughs> right a punchline they, they, they're so broad that it doesn't it doesn't resonate how much these billboards cost not the same as a tractor trailer let her go oh um i kind of need to use the bathroom i i didn't see it oh <laughs> That's, Mike. I think that's the best. <laughs> I, no, I mean, I'm like, just kidding. Well, here's, here's the thing, and, yeah. and it's not fair to judge a movie by its trailer, but, you know, when, <laughs> when the trailer came out and everyone's like, oh my God, this looks amazing, I watched the trailer and it's just, you know, pretty much Francis McDormand swearing at a whole bunch of people. I'm like, and that's the movie. Why am I just, <laughs> this does not look uh, uh, pleasant. I assume you can't say nothing defamatory and you can't say fuck, piss, or cunt, that right? Or anus? I did actually like it, though. I did like the film because it is so unapologetically aggressive that there is an element to it that is very gratifying to see. Okay. So on that level, you know, if you like gritty sort of Tarantino films, this is Tarantino mm -hmm. just without the monologues. Of the three billboards outside. You couldn't put an end to shit, you fucking retard. This is just a fucking start. Why don't you put that on your good morning Missouri fucking wake up broadcast, bitch? Let's talk about Dunkirk. Dunkirk. Did you guys all see yes, Dunkirk? Yes, mm -hmm. Why did it get nominated for like best sound editing? I couldn't understand a <laughs> fucking word anybody was saying that whole Thank picture. My son's one of you lot. If I saw the moon stone, they'll have her. I love the operatic nature of it. Yeah. That, that it had a, a soundtrack that was kind of flowing with the story. And it was, it was like, you know, you're just kind of like drawn in and you, you, the, the rhythm is, is happening. And, and, and it comes to this huge crescendo and then he goes home and there's life is supposed to be normal again, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, I, it was in my top 10. Tom Barrett. Here it is. I'll talk about the pros and the cons. So the pros are, I haven't seen a war film that doesn't have to rely on grisly violence. Yeah. There you that, go. Uh, makes you feel the absolute tension and horror of being stuck in a situation. Well, how about when the, when, the, when the whole container fills with water exactly. in like a second? Yeah. 
yeah. that's just like what and the know? camera's always just like constantly like, like uh, <laughs> no one is a fucking master editor he knows how to smoothly like transition between shots which like movement on 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 a cut to go to and that works beautifully with that when you intercut between each of these plot lines they're done so seamlessly and you mix that with Hans Zimmer's shepherd tone where the music's constantly having that wah, wah, wah sort of effect to it. It makes you feel like you just can't get out of there. And then when it finally does fall through, it's sort of, you know, that's your big crescendo moment. And that it, it worked, I think it would have worked wonderfully as a short film instead of a feature film. Hmm. But even so, even as a feature film, it's thrilling to see. All right, and, you're in between but, here, brother. But the, con, but the cons <laughs> are, the characters are really oh. flat, hmm. you know, and they're forgettable. And they're not like, say, like, if you want to use stock characters, do something like you did with Saving Private Ryan. When that medic died, I remember seeing that with my grandmother, and she was bawling seeing that scene. I want to go home. I want to go home. Mama, 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 mama. Dunkirk uh, came close to being, you know, one of my top films of the year, uh -huh. except for the kind of the rewatchability factor, I feel like yeah. I may never watch this movie again because I'm mm. never going to, exp unless it comes to like the music box, just kind of a revival. I feel like this is something where you need to see it in a theater yes. with surround sound, believe it or not, and just on the biggest screen possible and be immersed in it. 70 something percent of the film is the full IMAX format because it is the most beautiful way to watch a movie. It's a treat if you can see it in that format. Because the, the kind of still that's from this movie is, uh, you know, the publicity material is the scene of the bridge where everyone's kind of crowded uh, onto this bridge and they're, and they're looking up. And yeah. that's when they're about to be, they think they're, they're going to be dive bombed by these planes. And it's horrifying. And that's yeah. what, uh, that's one of the things that is so, the subjective terror of this movie is its strongest selling point. I don't know that that's going to be replicated, certainly not on my phone, but even on like my 42 inch TV or whatever. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, I got to get a new TV. Ah. But, uh, <laughs> it's a, such a sadness that you think you've seen a film on your fucking telephone. Get real. Yeah, you don't remember any of the characters. We're referring to people as Killian Murphy or uh, Tom Hardy. So I think that it speaks more to the that. fact that this is a movie that is about uh, set pieces and tension and not so much characters. Where's the bloody Air Force? Now, uh, we're going to move on to the post. Yeah. Do you have the papers? Not yet. It surprised me, okay? Mm. Uh, it surprised me for two reasons. Number one, Meryl Streep. When, when, they, when, the, when the preview came up, Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep, playing vague characters. It's almost like an SCTV review. Yeah. <laughs> if I can go back or, you know, it, it seemed like a satire. Yeah. It's directed by who else could direct them but Steven Spielberg? It has to be Spielberg. Steven Spielberg. Meryl Streep, Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep, and Tom Hanks, and Meryl. 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 Meryl, Tom, the Tom. Tom Hanks, Tom, 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 and then Meryl. And then Streep blows you away by her characterization of Catherine Graham. The story is a procedural. Spielberg puts the accelerator on the story rather than the characters. Yeah. It's an ensemble cast, they deliver it beautifully. Uh, the only, the only, uh, it wasn't in my top ten or anything, but I, it, it did um, emerge as something that uh, I really enjoyed because it was something of my era, number one. But also, I thought the re reporters, in retrospect, a little too heroic for my taste. Mm, but that's yeah. that's my that's my five cents on that one. It separated itself from most movies about journalism, which I really liked. You know. Oh, cool. the, the dynamic wasn't about the shock of the story. Oh my God, the priests are pedophiles. We gotta nail these scumbags. We gotta show people that nobody can get away with this. Not a priest or a cardinal or a freaking pope. 
oh my god you know <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, the, the what are you referring to yeah <laughs> the president broke into watergate which is so cool how they did the ending yeah yeah very cool i think he used the same shot from all the president's men he i'm did. almost positive he, he did. did yeah he did that that cross the street shot yeah I mean, yeah. It was so cool because it literally felt like the Batman Begins Joker ending of right. journalism movie endings. Right. You know, and it was just, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it was literally and that. And then watch all the President's Men, you got a great double feature. Exactly. So many movies about uh, uh, journalism, you know, kind of like have a flat white because it's like paper or color palette to it. But here you got Lucas, who he's got Yamish Kaminsky's eyes, and they're, they're always flying around the subject. So there's that wonderful scene where the whole house is just filled with articles, you know, about yeah. the Vietnam War. And he got the little girl with the lemonade, which is a wonderful that's, touch. That's, I mean, those were the things that really surprised me in, in, a, in a Spielbergian sense, yeah. or, or Spielbergo sense. <laughs> Listen, Senior Spielbergo, I want you to do for me what Spielberg did for Oscar Schindler. He, he really went for something different. And he really uh, applied himself in a different way yeah. and created something that I think will last for, you know, I mean, people will be watching this uh, uh, a generation from now to get an indication of what people were th thinking a generation after it happened. Yeah. So, you know, back and forth. Oh, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do, Mrs. Graham? Our surprise Oscar nominee this year, or maybe it wasn't a surprise because we had the Dream Team, which maybe was my favorite nominee, was uh, Phantom Thread. Mm. You can sew almost anything into the canvas of a coat. Here, here's my problem. I focus more on story, and this is maybe yeah. another one I have to see again. But I, I just could not get into that relationship. I think mm. I've seen too many relationships like that. Yeah. And I, I just don't like when, 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 uh, when a couple starts playing psychological games yeah. against each other, and then they start competing. And that's exactly what happened. And, um, and yet, uh, yet I could see the beauty of it. I just, it, just, it, it was flat for me because of the story. Maybe one day you'll change your taste, Alma. Maybe not. Maybe you have no taste. The, the reason you hated it, the reason I really <laughs> liked it, well, uh, which is, and again, it's 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 a different film for everyone, which is yep. it really... It really is. That's, goes, that's for sure. Yeah, it goes into the complicities and the nuances of being in a relationship where everyone's sort of little idiosyncrasies will drive you insane. Right. I know when I'm, when I'm editing footage or when I'm writing, maybe when... You're writing, maybe like when you're editing your podcast, if someone's just in the same room and they just like <laughs> put a glass down like that, it's just like. <laughs> I'm taking it out. Yeah, but it's a bit late now, isn't it? But I'm taking it out. The tea is going out. The interruption is staying right here with me. Oh my God, Johnny Greenwood score. <laughs> I was listening to it. It was, the whole, it, was uh, it was magnificent. Yeah. I mean, if there's only if there's one thing that could beat the Dunkirk score, it's this score. It better. It, it should. It should. It yeah. Should. I agree. I mean, Hans already has his Oscar. For yeah, Gladiator. that's true. And the Oscar goes to Hans Zimmer for The Lion King. When you get to that third act, it becomes a P.T. Anderson film. And either you're going to be on board with it or you're not. Because uh, have you seen it? Here's the thing. Yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't rush out to see it yeah. because I was not a fan of Inherent Vice and I was not a fan yeah. of The Master at all. See, there, now, here's I mean, a, when those, you say, uh, that's when, two recommendations you were correct on. But when you say a P.T. Anderson film, to me that means two different things. Yeah. There's like pre-The Master, pre-Inherent Vice, where he's kind of doing this Terrence Malick redo kind of a deal, whereas mm -hmm. his earlier stuff, I used to be a really big Paul Thomas Anderson fan, and mm -hmm. now it's 
really kind of a gamble. Like, I don't know if I want to get off the couch mm. to go see this, but <laughs> you know. That's I, uh, what I love about them. You don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, but yeah. here's the thing. If it goes south, you're there for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Box cover, covered in moss. Fields running around, barbed wire. You're just describing my experience at yeah, Phantom Threads. Exactly. So. Well, yeah, I, mean, I was into it, but I can definitely see why people wouldn't be. Yeah. And it's a film that I think that's what makes a great film. Like, you, you, you could be split on it. Case in point, Mother. Either people are going to think you're the oh, best picture of the year, or you're going to be a Razzie. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you do, do it carefully. You guys got to help me with this one. Did you guys see Call Me By Your Name? Yes, yes. I did. Why does we everybody did. love this film? I know I'm wrong. Professor Perlman. Thank you so much. So nice. Très confiant. Here's the, the weird, prudish, almost meta concern that I have with it. <laughs> I miss the part where they say how old Timothy Chamolet's character is. I think they refer he is 17, and at some point people have told me they say he's 17, but I missed it. And I'm like, huh. there's such a, a physical looking age difference between his character and Army Hammer that I'm yeah. like, are they, is it okay that they're doing this? Yeah. Um, and then yeah. when, it, when they get into their relationship, I guess that was sort of the point or the style of the film to show how clumsy lovemaking can be between two people or yeah. uh, the relationship. My wife and I, I'm sorry, we were laughing at parts of it and we uh -huh. felt kind of bad. We're like, this isn't supposed to be one. funny, but. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Basically, he applies the fruit in a place of his body that we will not name and he. The movie left me cold and I know it's getting a lot of praise and I know the film I'm about to reference did not get a lot of praise, but. I felt that the same themes were executed much more efficiently with, I think, a longer runtime. And Blue is the Warmest Color from a few mm, years ago. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, it's, a, it's the exact same film. That's, yeah. oh, that's really, that's really. Except in, I think, Except Paris. Blue is the Warmest I, Color, like, had conflict. I, I, think <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I think I slightly liked it a little better than you. I, I, I did love the scene with Michael Stolberg where he's. He, he, oh, that he, was a great scene. He I'll creates that, yeah. a creates a safe space for his son. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did like the fact, too, that he eventually did get engaged because it was a time where people were on the down low still. You know, a lot of, a lot of guys in my generation remained closeted, got married, had kids. And then, you know, when everything loosened up, they got divorced and lived with their, you know, down low yeah. lover. But I didn't buy Hammer as much as that character and Tim and and Timothy just had to be uh you know the innocent so he, he he was able to handle that fairly well I thought he was much better in Lady Bird honestly I like the ending it, it did sag in the front it sagged in the front yeah. there is a lot of, of of just extemporaneous BS in this movie. <sighs> and I mean a, a good a good run through through the editing machine probably would have uh, yeah. made it a little more I, I, I think tighter, so. I think that's will. what the, no pun intended oh. I think that that was uh, <laughs> that was the problem with me with this film one of the more philistine of the Farnese popes melted them down and had them recast as a particularly voluptuous Venus. I felt like where the ending was beautiful, I wish that was sort of the film. Because I felt like there needed to be some sort of conflict. Not, oh my god, he's this young, how could you do that sort of conflict. But uh, more of like, he's in love, but now Army Hammer's with this woman. And he has to accept the fact that he was just sort of this part of his life. And I wish that was more of the film rather than these two wistfully loving each other. <laughs> and yeah, that's what we have to see. I Italy. like. I want to see it again to understand it. Call me by your name, and I'll call you by mine. Last film and least is the <laughs> Darkest Hour, where oh. uh, I liked it. It was pure Oscar bait. It was you know, Oscar bait. Yeah. And I don't know, it was exactly what I expected when I walked in. We must now select my successor and it's only one man the opposition will accept. He stands for one thing and one thing only, himself. 
Uh, it plays all the familiar beats. It's about a leader facing self-doubt. There's rousing speeches. I'm reading this straight off my phone. Yes, I am. Uh, there, <laughs> there's old man in makeup and fat suits. You know, there's prestigious Englishmen. This is the king's speech of this year. You know, there's the wife who's our protagonist, <laughs> oh sort of rock. And then there's a closing, what happens to everybody afterwards in the title. And, of course, our protagonist is proven correct and is victorious. Whenever I think of the King's Speech, I think of that scene. <laughs> <laughs> oh, feel the listeners of the jaw. <laughs> I just want to see that. I can only do it one shit at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I am sealed in the privy. I can only deal with one shit at a time. I thought it had some really good scenes in it, but yeah. overall it was like, like you said, it was the prestigious British film. The Prime Minister. The Prime Minister. The scene in the, in the tube is the whole movie for me. Yeah. You know, when it, it was almost a fantasy sequence where, you know, Churchill is going to ride the tube to his greatest speech and he's going to, you know, uh, uh, mix with a diverse <laughs> a British crowd. You know, yeah. there were, it was like, uh, you know, it was almost like a fantasy sequence. Yeah. But I happened to see the movie Churchill earlier mm. in the year with Brian yeah. Cox. And to me, that was the more interesting story. Mm. You must remember, Ike, we fought the Germans in France before. Even if you break through in Normandy, even with the massive casualties, civilian and military, what will our boys face in France? Hmm? I mean, you do get the, the conflict that Churchill's going through. Nothing inglorious in trying to shorten a war that we are clearly losing. Losing! Europe is still... Europe is lost. That is a crowd pleaser. I'd say that. It's a movie you can take your grandma to. For without victory, there can be no survival. All right, so thank you so much, Pat McDonald. I want, I want to see that scene. Thank you, Ian Simmons. Simmons. It was Simmons. I was going to say Simmons. Hey, call me by my name. Oh! Sorry. Sorry. All right. <laughs> Who's got a peach? All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you guys so much. Right. And that's a wrap. We'll see you at the Oscars. Really? We're going? <laughs>